Boston can take pride in its world-class symphony orchestra, but it's also a world-class hub of early music. And that begins with the Handel and Haydn Society, dating from 1815, possibly the oldest continuously performing arts organization in the United States. The period instrument ensemble is also getting attention for the latest in its series of recordings with music by Haydn and Mozart. To share the news is the Society's artistic director, Harry Christopher. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Harry. Pleasure, Chris. First of all, before you came, uh, uh, recordings by Handel and Haydn Society were, were almost a contradiction in terms. So th this is a big change. Uh, what's going on with this? Yes, you're quite right. There weren't many when I arrived, and I just thought it was uh, important that we should actually develop a record catalogue. Um, and so I started with Mozart, um, C minor mass, followed by Requiem and Coronation Mass. And then I thought, really important, let's, why don't we concentrate on one of our na namesakes, Haydn. Um, he's often thought of as, a, as the grandfather of the symphony, and that to me makes him sound rather sort of um, old-fashioned and boring, but he's not, and put period instruments on it, and it's, uh, he's, he's such a phenomenal composer, full of wit, charm, emotion, well, be, before uh, early music became more widespread mm -hmm. in, in interpreting these works, um, I grew up hearing these old recordings where it, it, you know, Haydn was the precursor of uh, the late 19th mm -hmm. century, you know, the, the high octane kind of Haydn. Yes. Uh, what do you get that's better with this leaner, but also more folksy kind of Haydn too? Well, I mean, partly it's to do with the instruments, because, you know, if you're playing on period instruments, you're very much getting into the sound world that Haydn knew and loved and what he was writing for. So right from the start, you're, you're making the music sound new to modern ears because they're hearing uh, you know, violins on gut strings, uh, the woodwind instruments, the sort of precursors of what we hear today. Um, and so immediately, as I say, it sounds modern, it sounds inventive. Um, plus the fact, I think, you know, one thing that the early music movement did is it made us, it made us much more aware of, of what was possible in this music. And Haydn, far from being um, uh, at all boring, is so inventive. And the humour that comes out of him, the drama that comes out in his music. And we just have to be able to think, actually, we can exaggerate what he wants. We can really get into his music. Uh, one thing I remember about Haydn is that um, he, used to, he used to go for walks practically every day of his life. And he used to take a notebook with him. And he used to drop down things about the nature, um, the animals he saw, the birds he heard, and everything of that reflects in his symphonies. There's always some aspect of nature crawling around, whether it be you know the big storm type um, things or to do with weather, um, uh, the, the animals, and and then also his minuet and trios, which are the classic thing. Every every classical symphony has a minuet and a trio, a dance, a normal dance. But you'll find the trios in in Haydn are incredibly amusing. Uh, you know, you really do get the feeling that there's a, a, an old man there dancing who's got two left feet and uh, or there's a person, who, the, the charmer that comes into the ballroom that everybody wants to look at and Haydn's depicting all these little things. Well, I, I've heard some of these things played with the, with the uh, bigger orchestras mm. and they sound kind of heavy. Yeah. Uh, there's one minuet in this new album you have out. Uh, it's pretty quick, mm. but it rocks. It does, it does, it all of it does. I mean, you're quite right about the modern orchestra. I feel sorry for the modern orchestra because Haydn actually is hard to play. I think it was, um, it was somebody like uh, Laurie Marzell or something that was asked once, you know, why do you never perform Haydn? And he said, well, it's just too difficult. And, and that's the thing, Haydn for string players is really hard and you have to be sort of playing it um, you know, month in, month out to really get to the bottom of it. And that's what's special about Haydn, Handel and Haydn. Uh, another thing in the same symphony, there, there's a slow movement which is pretty unusual and uh, it's not something you can play on autopilot. Were you thinking of something like opera? In the, because you've, you've done choral mm, work in opera yes, too. Yes. Yeah, well, I speak, you know, funny enough, you, you're quite right, Chris, because I, I actually often talk to the orchestra in vocal terms, and I often talk to the chorus in, in instrumental terms, um, and there's a lot that, that's going on there. I, I think with any slow movement of Haydn, you've, you've got to know how you're pacing it, and it's all to do with uh, ebb and flow and not being a metronome. So you give the piece light and shade, ebb and flow, I often use those terms, and it, it makes the, you know, the piece live and have, have breath and, and air to it. This has been a news, and we're talking with Harry Christopher, artistic director of the Handel and Haydn Society. Harry, what's also interesting in your programming is you're not just stuck within the period, but I guess you're more about how one period speaks to other periods. Talk about what you've got planning 
to, into the year ahead with some of the programming. Well, um, for the rest of this year, we, we've got B minor mass uh, this coming weekend, Bach's B minor mass, which is part of, um, you know, Bach. I don't know what it was about Bach. Bach left us a legacy. He left us the art of fugue, um, you know, Goldberg variations. Brandenburg concertos, and then at the B minor mass, this piece that was never performed in his lifetime as an entity because it was a big Catholic mass. It's a staggering work of, of, of invention. And what, and again, sounds absolutely amazing on period instruments. Um, it's just these tone colors of oboes and obo de mores and the flute, the wooden flute. It's, it's quite beautiful. And for a modern listener, it's it's sort of, it's a, it's a revelation, it's just delightful. And uh, again, a, you know, wonderful chorus writing, um, taxing everybody um, to, the, to, to the ultimate. Um, and that's, I think that's wonderful. I've also got um, Purcell's Fairy Queen, um, probably the best British composer who ever lived. Um, and this is, a, it's, this is just charm and mystery and beauty all in all in one um, it, Purcell wrote it as, as sort of music for for Shakespeare's uh, Midsummer Night's Dream but uh, Purcell doesn't set a word of Shakespeare but he, yet he conjures up you know the, the fairies the, the magical woods the Titania and Oberon and then um, there's, there's it's it's a f fantastic piece um, full of bucolic romp as well as a marvelous scene for Corridor and a mop so and a, uh, the whole piece starts with a drunken poet stammering his way through and uh, so that that would be great uh, one of the great things about this this performance coming up in uh, in april is i've got my daughter coming out who's going to be narrating um a script written by jeremy sams which ties the whole piece together talk about how this music uh, from this period that speaks to later music because next year you've got works by Beethoven, mm -hmm. Schubert, you, you got a Chacon by uh, Purcell that inspired yeah. Britain in one of his quartets. So this, this, this is a living tradition that, that really ripples out. It is, you know, it's, it's a legacy and you, you just need to look through, even through to, to the sort of peasant day how many composers are, inf are highly influenced from music from the Renaissance, the Baroque and early classical and you see this great progression. Um, and I think we have to remember that, you know, in, Bar in Baroque times in sort of the 17th century, you know, the Enlightenment and this, this music was just uh, fantastic music for the court, music for the opera, uh, music for the church, uh, just uh, quite amazing. Um, and we look at later composers like Beethoven, of course, and Brahms later, who, who looked back constantly to what was happening by their, with their predecessors. And if we take Bach as one composer of our, of our period instrument world, I mean, Bach is, is just extraordinary. If a composer wrote something even resembling the B minor mass today, they would be think this is this is contemporary music at its in its at its ultimate. We should mention uh, the obvious too here. If people want some more details. You've got the website they can check out. Yeah. Yes. Uh, www.handelandhaydensociety.org. I think it is here. Yeah. Thank you very much for being with us. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Harry Christopher is from the Handel and Haydn Society. Up ahead, high school sports and playoff highlights with Pat Flaherty.